through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 211. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Hyde Park on Hudson, we're mm -hmm. talking Bill Murray. Yes. Amazing we haven't talked to him before. I know. Excellent Bill Murray, actor. The man, the myth, the legend. I mean, he's definitely been more quirky stuff in his latter years, I guess you would say. Yeah. So perhaps maybe it wasn't the big release that brought him to us or something that week. But, okay. you know, it's, it's good that we yeah. have an opportunity to talk about it him is. I think he's been a, also a lot of uh, side roles or smaller roles in films yeah. recently. So we probably have been focusing on sure. other people. Let's get started, though. Yes. We're going to go way back, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, before most people even are familiar yes. with him, and talk Where the Buffalo Roam. Mm -hmm. This is the 1980 film, um, semi-autobiographical film about uh, Hunter, Hunter S. Thompson. Thompson. Yes, the first with, in film incarnation yes, of Hunter S. Thompson. With Bill Murray playing Hunter S. Thompson. Yes. Uh, what... You, you were the one who wanted to put this on our list. Yeah, this, what was it brought that this to your? This was one of those things where, like, I follow. I I was when I was introduced to Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, mm. the film. I kind of followed the rabbit hole and read a bunch of his books, and then found out that one of the few of his books I hadn't read. Or, actually, I don't think Where the Buffalo Roam is one of his books. I think it's based on a couple. Uh, mm. But I I was like, oh, there's this mo Bill Murray played Hunter S. Thompson. That's got to be, I got to check that out. Okay, so it's based on the stories The Banshee Screams for Buffalo Meat and Strange Rumblings in Aslan. Yes, which I believe The Banshee Screams for Buffalo Meat is the autobiography of um, of Laszlo, the person okay. that Laszlo's mm. based on, mm. which is where the title comes from. So played it's like by Peter Boyle. Yes, which is another amazing thing, because that's mm. a role that that same character later played by Benicio Del Toro. Yeah, that's To think crazy. Peter Boyle and Benicio Del Toro, like, Bill Murray and Johnny Depp, a little bit easier to say. They could play the same character. <laughs> young. When you're looking at young young Bill Murray versus Johnny Depp, maybe. you could see at least a physical similarity, I, I would yeah, think. Yeah, maybe a little. I would think. They're both... It's a big They're both stretch similar both sized brown haired white men as I opposed guess. to gigantic old Peter Boyle and, you know, Hispanic Benicio del Toro. I just it's an anyway. interesting yeah, combination. But, but yeah. I mean, it, it's so weird to think of. I mean, A, Bill Murray really, I mean, very, very rarely. I mean, this might have been the only time he's played mm -hmm. a real person before, but it's so weird to think of him playing Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. Like, I don't even think of those two in the same stratosphere. I know. Like, Johnny Depp, you can sort of see because mm -hmm. he's quirky like that. Yeah. But Bill Murray, like, I would never even think about this. Yeah. And, oh, I, I actually found it here. Uh, the character of Carl Laszlo is based on the 90, 1960s Chicano lawyer Oscar Zeta Acosta, who was briefly hit. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson's lawyer during the 70s, and the base of the character for Dr. Gonzo in Fear in Las Vegas. The title of this movie is an allusion to Acosta's book, Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo. So that story is probably an original one allusion to this. Yeah. So, either way. But, you know, it's, 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 it's funny to think about, too, because, you know, this is like prime time comedy Bill Murray mm -hmm. time, and this is not necessarily that. So, mm -hmm. I mean... And it definitely carried over, too. It's one of those things that you can tell, again, same way Johnny Depp hung out with Hunter S. Thompson, Bill Murray spent a lot of time with Hunter S. Thompson drinking and shooting and basically wow. screwing around on Hunter S. Thompson's Colorado ranch. And after filming ended, Murray continued to act gonzo throughout the beginning of the next season of Saturday Night Live, much to the chagrin and annoyance of cast and crew members. Like, excellent. that's how much he grabbed onto that role. That's excellent. I mean, it seems like, you know, if you go down that rabbit hole and you're able to do that, yeah. that'd be pretty awesome. And it also says something about Bill Murray that is going to be a trend we're going to see, which is that when he cares about a role, he latches onto it hard, and mm -hmm. it usually carries over into other parts of his life. I thought it was interesting also that the director, Art Linson, mm -hmm. um... Only directed one other movie called The really? Wild Life, starring Eric Stoltz. Huh. Teen Romp, interestingly enough. Weird. But curiously enough, he became quite the prolific producer. Interesting. He did, let's see, Untouchables. Wow. He did Scrooge. He okay. did Dick Tracy. He did Fight Club. He Whoa. did Into the Wild. This guy's been everywhere. Clearly, directing might not have been his forte, but producing, man, mm -hmm. dude has some chops. Yeah, probably so. got involved and was like, I don't want to be in that much in control. I want... <laughs> it's crazy, yeah. You yeah. probably saw how the was it the sausage was made. And <laughs> yes. To get out yes, of there but you, If you're a Hunter S. Thompson fan, you should check out where the Buffaloes roam. If for nothing else to see a much more on point and less comedic, much more serious, dark mm. portrayal of Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. Obviously, going a very different direction. Mm -hmm. The same year, 
Caddyshack. Yeah. We're talking the, was it the Harold Ramis? Yes. Classic about a golf, mm -hmm. I, what do you describe, a golf Caddy. course? Yeah, a, I mean, a, a it's golf a, course. It's a cast of characters yes. who interact on this golf course. Mm -hmm. I mean, one... Based on one of Bill Murray's brothers, uh, Brian Doyle yes, Murphy. Yes, Brian Doyle Murphy. He, he, Harold Ramis, and Bill Murray were all caddies in their youth. Really? And so mostly it's Brian Doyle Murphy's experiences as a caddy kind of collected into a story. That's funny. So he's like Michael O'Keefe then, Danny Noonan in the movie? He's Probably. Like caddy. That's Probably. interesting. I mean, because it's so, it's, I mean, you think about the film and yeah, Bill or Murray's in it. caddy that's been experiencing all those things going on. Yeah. You, I mean, you think about it though. You think, yeah, Bill Murray's in the film mm -hmm. and yeah, he's very funny as the groundskeeper. Yes. Like the whole battle with mm -hmm. the, the gopher. Very funny. Yes. But he's really kind of a small part of the movie. Yes. It's much more about, you know, the battle between Chevy Chase. Mm -hmm. With Rodney Dangerfield and yes. Ted Knight. Those two against Ted Knight, essentially. They're sort of like the more loose, liberal guys on the mm -hmm. golf course where they're just having fun, not taking it seriously. And which, Ted Knight is the judge who's very serious about which it. Which is very much a difference from the original screenplay that first came out was much more about the actual caddies hmm. and their life. But after Harold Ramis got people like Chevy Chase and Bill Murray and uh, Rodney Dangerfield involved, he kind of let them run mm. with what they did, and that ended up pushing most of the other story back and into the background and kind of away. When they, originally it was more supposed to be focused about Danny, like full-on Danny all the time. Or, mm. I think that's his name, right? The caddy? Yeah, yeah the caddy, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was supposed to be more all about that. Like, And that's actually the more serious story in the movie. Yep. I mean, honestly. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I like Bill Murray as sort of like a comedic relief, but it's definitely... It steps away from all the other stories mm -hmm. in the movie when you go with the Bill Murray. Yeah, and I mean, this just goes to show how much those that star power kind of like mm. overtook the original idea. Uh, the famous scene that begins when Ty crashes his ball into Carl's hovel, mm. where Bill Murray and, yeah. and Chevy Chase then hang out, uh, was not in the original script. Huh. It was added by Harold Ramis after realizing that he had Chevy Chase and Bill Murray on this movie and that they didn't have any scenes together. Mm. So he took, that uh, they didn't have a scene together, the three of them met for lunch and wrote the scene together, all mm. three of them, which is the most interesting thing because Bill Murray and Chevy Chase at the time kind of had a feud from Saturday Night Live still going on. Uh, even though it has nothing to do with the plot, it's often considered one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Uh, and it's the only time, the only time Chase and Murray have appeared in a movie together. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I should note, though, also that, you know, Harold, these these guys have all sort of crossed paths mm -hmm. a lot of times. I mean, yes. Harold Ramis worked on uh, Ghostbusters, mm -hmm. which we'll probably talk about. Mm -hmm. He did Vacation, obviously, with yes. Chase. Yeah. Groundhog Day, Analyze This. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's sort of like, well, not Analyze This, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> they're... they're, they're He's done a lot of other films, mm -hmm. but my point being, like those guys are definitely yes. people that have interacted with yeah. each other a lot throughout their careers, mm -hmm. for sure. So. And it's crazy when you when you realize that it goes so far back as like Harold Ramis and the Murray brothers uh, being friends when yeah. they were young. Yeah. Like, that's it, an old it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Actually, I think a lot of those mm -hmm. sort of partnerships develop out of stuff yeah. like that. So, definitely. I mean, you think about like Owen Wilson and uh, Wes Anderson, mm -hmm. and whatnot, so. which we'll also talk about. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Ghostbusters, mm -hmm. let's move right along to that. 1984, the Ivan Reitman classic, mm -hmm. uh, written by Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd. Yep. This is you know, the story of a group of, I guess you'd call them misfits, yeah. who find themselves as Ghostbusters. Uh, originally, Dan Aykroyd's original idea for the film involved them being Ghostbusters in the future, where they were like where ghostbusters were like police and firefighters they were just a regular part mm. of everyday life and Harold Ramis said that would cost 300 million dollars in 1984 dollars to do so let's make it present day instead and pull back i don't know if it would cost 300 million dollars but that was his quote at the time but that being so. said like i don't know like i i think this idea works better in my opinion i i, agree. I, I like sort of like this like the sort of misfit angle of yeah. it, where these are guys who kind of more an origin story. Yeah, and they, but they like they have this belief in what they're doing, mm -hmm. even though it's sort of crazy, and most people don't believe it. <laughs> yeah. But only when stuff starts going wrong, people start coming to them, and it sort of changes it. And it's sort of like these guys who aren't necessarily heroes have to become heroes mm -hmm. to save the day, you know, against Stay Puft Marshmallow yes. and stuff like that. So it's it's really interesting. It's also funny to think because you know you think of Ghostbusters from the cartoon uh -huh. that's sort of a light comedic kind of thing <laughs> and the movie's much darker oh definitely especially the, the, the first, second one the very first scene in the first Ghostbusters with the library and uh, finding the ghost and all mm. the cards spinning out that 
that gave me nightmares for years as a kid. Like, more than the rest of the movie. The rest of the movie didn't scare yeah. me as much as that and the, the creepy dogs that chase, chase Rick Moranis. Those were the two things as a kid. Well, yeah. I mean, I that, like, oh, for and sure. Of course, when some, oh. someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. Right. <laughs> but, like... You know, it's it is it's dark. Like mm -hmm. I mean, there are there's quite a bit of comedy. And don't get me wrong, but yeah. like you know, when they're battling at the end, when you know um, Sigourney Weaver's mm -hmm. place haunted, like there's oh. all this sort of stuff that is fairly fairly dark, mm -hmm. and it's sort of interesting, much like Beetlejuice, how this got spun into yeah. a light cartoon light fair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and it's also weird. It's one of those movies that had so many different scenes that were filmed and then panned mm -hmm. and shown laser disc and supposed to be there uh most uh, going with kind of bill murray what early bill murray was like it is not surprising that almost every almost none of the scenes were filmed and scripted really like just as that Mo almost all of them had at least one or two ad libs well, it's all kind of I, I, th thank you for reminding me i was going to say that you know this feels like bill murray becoming who i sort of mm -hmm. see bill murray as a sort of like a quick wish witted dick ish type yes. character and that's yes. sort of like exactly who mm -hmm. he is in this movie which will come back uh, a lot which will come back a lot not only in his roles but in it's some important things i think about his roles uh you know i like to talk about Temporal things, uh, things in the moment, in that that happened while the movie was out, and how strange mm -hmm. they are. Ghostbusters is one of those people don't do this anymore because of Ghostbusters kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the film's initial release to keep interest going, Ivan Reitman had a trailer, which was just a commercial for the film, for the movie, but like a commercial for the Ghostbusters themselves uh, as cool. this initial trailer. And in it, he took and had a number in it, but with, instead of a 555 oh, fake no, number, a he had a 1-800 number. number, which allowed people to call. And if they called, they got Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray saying, hi, we're out catching ghosts right now. That's that's cool. They got 1,000 calls an hour, 25, 24 hours a day, for six weeks. Wow. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. why you don't do that anymore. But that's why everyone uses 555 You numbers. also think about, like, you know, this one is a very popular movie. I mean, mm -hmm. made almost 300 million worldwide. Mm -hmm. But it's also it was also fairly critically acclaimed. Really? I mean, it was nominated for Best Motion Picture, Comedy, or Musical at the Golden Globes. Okay. Lost to Romancing the Stone, which, mm. I mean, I personally mm. would take Ghostbusters over that. But, you know, that's a good film That'd as well. That'd be an interesting argument yeah. to have it's someday. A, it's a good film as well. Sit down and watch both. But you might be able to argue this one a little bit more. Um... Bill Murray was nominated for Best Actor in a really? comedy. Lost to Dudley Moore for Mickey and Maude. Mm, yeah. I, I, Sorry, Dudley Moore. Yeah, I mean... I mean, uh, if you're going to nominate Bill Murray for Peter Venkman, wasn't he Venkman? Yeah, Peter Venkman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean... That's 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 right up there with the Caddyshack as far as like classic Murray roles that people. But at remember. the same time, you know, you think about this. This is like yeah, not during very the early time, in his true. career. It's so true. like you look back and you're like, duh. But like, yeah. it's funny to think about. Yeah. You know, got nominated Gotta for that love role. Those moments. So, let's uh, let's move forward though. Mm -hmm. uh, almost a decade actually. Another, I would say, you know, beloved film. If you ask I would me. Agree. But it seems like, it, in some ways, it's vastly sort of like... forgotten? Yeah, vastly forgotten and vastly underappreciated. Oh, yeah, totally underappreciated. And we're talking about What About Bob? As far as I'm concerned, What About Bob might as well be one of the, like, quintessential Murray roles, which is why I'm glad we're talking about it. So it amazes which, me that... Which is the story, you know, of a, mm, a, yes. a psychiatric patient played by Bill Murray yes. who is relentlessly yes. stalking and harassing his therapist played you, by Richard You Dreyfuss. could almost say he's a hypochondriac for a therapist yeah oh, in the totally. sense of like he's all got so many crazy problems going on upstairs that he is like attached to the hip to richard dreyfus who yes. wants to be yes. at least and wants richard Dreyfus to cure every problem and melody well it's not it's not just that he wants him to but he thinks that he is true he feels yes. like he is the mm -hmm. one who's curing it and it's yeah. sort of whether he actually did anything or not which is really not yeah but he thinks he is so he starts just like stalking him <laughs> yeah. much to richard yes. Dreyfus' chagrin <laughs> especially since everybody else seems to like him everyone loves bob especially except his family for, except for richard Dreyfus. Yes. <laughs> and it ends up driving him nuts mm -hmm. and it's so funny it's like, so good I, it's so good like and you think about like the cast in addition to it you know his family's like julie haggerty mm -hmm. obviously from airplane and charlie corsmo who went on to uh be awesome and can't hardly wait as oh, well yes yeah mm -hmm. so it's i mean it's got a great fun cast directed by uh frank oz yeah yeah i know how cool is that look at his career though uh he did little shop of horrors yeah he did Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Oh. He did Indian in the Cupboard? Really? Like yeah. the semi-recent ish one? Yeah. Wow. Well, 1997 well, or something. Recent ish. Yeah. He did In and Out with Kevin okay. Klein. Uh -huh. He did Bowfinger. 
Wow. And you think about it, he did the score. The one with Edward Norton, Robert De Niro, and Marlon Brando. That Whoa. was him. He did uh, Frank Oz. The, the original Death at a Funeral, which uh -huh, was then remade yeah. by Neil yeah. Laboot. And obviously he did all the shit in The Muppets, too, on top yeah, of all and that. Yoda. Yeah, yeah, and Yoda. <laughs> just Yoda, you know, NBD, just yeah. Yoda. Yeah, exactly. Frank Oz is pretty freaking awesome, yeah. if you ask me. So. I think it, it, you know, it's 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 an interesting point simply because it, it, it just seems that, it seems like Bill Murray, it was much like Chevy Chase, I would say still is, uh, kind of volatile. Mm. Oh, yeah. Especially in his early career yeah, with totally. people he worked sure, with. And sure. this is a classic example of that because according to Richard Dreyfuss, he and Bill Murray did not get along at all really? during the filming of this movie. <laughs> which I think probably helped the film. Probably. Because if you imagine, Bill Murray is probably used to people not liking him, so it probably made it more fun for him to annoy Richard Dreyfuss. Mm -hmm. And Richard Dreyfuss was probably more annoyed looking. Well, <laughs> and yeah, it's perfect for their relationship, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, to sort of give you, again, perspective of how it's sort of underappreciated or, or for overlooked, mm. it's it only was really nominated for, like, MTV Awards really? for Bill Murray for Best Comedic Performance, which wow. he lost to Billy Crystal for City Slickers. Oh. But that's about it. I mean, it. don't get me wrong. Like, the first City Slickers is okay. But, like, if there was ever a backlash, it was, like, the hangover experience. City Slickers 2 was made. Everyone realized it was the same movie. And people like me are, could not watch their first one anymore and be enjoy it. So I, I like the first one still quite a bit. I mean, you I have, mean, like, Jack Palance and stuff. Oh, no, yeah. Which... Don't get me wrong. It has a good part, points in it. I'm not saying that City Slickers is a bad movie. But, I mean, just, I don't know. I don't know if that's a Billy Crystal comedic performance that I would say is worthy of this. I, th I think it would be a good debate. I think yeah. it would. I, th I mean, I, I think I think you could debate that one pretty well. Billy Crystal's a pretty funny dude, and yeah, that is her prime time Billy Crystal. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I, th I, th I, th I think that'd be a that'd be a good debate. Moving right along, mm -hmm. another beloved Bill Murray film, yes. though that's still, I mean, at least you know, in terms of its release, is a lot smaller than I imagined it would be, and that's. Groundhog Day. Yes. This is the classic about a man who's sort of, how would you describe him? Gruff, Cursed? Gruff towards the world. Oh, yes, yes. Like, he, yes. he hates everyone kind of, around uh, him. What's, he hates the, his what's life. the term for that? Um, for people who uh, hate all people. I can't remember it right now. Not misogynistic, because that's women. male hating men. Yeah, women. <laughs> but there's. Um, It'll, it'll come to me. I'll spurt it out randomly. Okay. For anyway, he's, he just likes, you know, the people around him. Mm -hmm. He just likes his job. He sort of takes that out on everyone. Mm -hmm. And then he's struck with this. A very Bill Murray-esque performance. Yeah, exactly. You know, as we said with, like, you know, um, Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. Very sort of similar yes. persona. But, you know, he's stuck in this repeating day over mm -hmm. and over again, living out the same events over and over again. And, you know, he's stuck with what he has to do with yes. this why this is going on and you know again directed by harold ramis mm -hmm. again you know them yes. partnering up again this time uh it's harold ramis as a writer director producer oh wow um but you know it's great sort of eclectic cast who ends up working out tremendously well mm -hmm. who i wouldn't have necessarily thought together you know you got like andy mcdowell yeah. as the love interest mm -hmm. you have chris elliott as oh, not yeah, really a right. quirky he's not, not playing a weirdo no he's pretty normal like, he's yeah. actually like a pretty nice guy <laughs> yeah, a pretty yeah. likable guy and then you it's have kind of like, creepy to watch in retrospect i keep expecting him to do something like cabin boy like yeah, these oh, pipes yeah, totally. are clean yeah yeah totally and then you have like uh <laughs> steven tobolowski as ned oh, ryerson yeah. and stuff who everyone remembers like that's the role i'll always remember mm -hmm. steven tobolowski for but it's it's so funny it's got a little bit of a dark edge to it yeah but it's 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 very very and funny. so this is again we're we're going in these lines of like Bill Murray being comedic roles where they're actually a lot more darker than they're probably perceived or remembered in mm. retrospects. People just get so much humor out of Bill Murray's hate that they remember the the them laughing, not Bill Murray right. being it's, this like it feels horrible. Dick. Perceive it much lighter yes. than it is. Yes. Yes. And I mean, this just goes to show with it because you've got a couple things that involve that in the film. First, I normally don't care much about who was other else was considered for a role, but in this right. case, I think it's relevant. Harold Ramis considered Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, and John Travolta all for the role of Phil Connors. I could see all of them except John Travolta. That feels like weird. a bit of a pill. But, but see, this is the thing. This is why you can see John Travolta not immediately falling out of the running, even if he doesn't seem like a good choice in the first place. But they were all considered far too nice. 
That's so funny. he instead, it, com in comparison to Bill Murray. Well, I just find a thing about John Travolta because it's almost like Harold Ramis could have been Quentin Tarantino mm -hmm. before Quentin Tarantino. Because if, if, if John Travolta was in yeah, this, what year or two before? When I think it was, it was a year before yeah. Pulp Fiction. And the other one thing I like is that according to Harold Ramis again, uh, most of the times whenever he was talking to Bill Murray about a scene about how he wanted him to play it, Bill Murray would just kind of cut to it and be like, "Listen, is it good Phil or is it bad Phil?" And like that's how he was playing it. He had two roles, which I think really goes to show and polarize the character of Phil Connor so much in Groundhog Day because mm -hmm. that there isn't any weird gray area where you're never sure. He's either love like actually being a good person or he's horribly bitter and acerbic. Yeah. So I mean, it's funny. As beloved as this film is, it only made eighty million dollars in the U.S. Hmm. Or seventy million, sorry, wow. seventy, and which I th would have thought it would have made like one hundred and fifty million yeah. in the U.S. Because everybody loves this movie. Wow. I wonder if I don't it's know. considered a cult classic because of its. No, I, th cost. I mean, I, I think worldwide it probably made a couple hundred million, okay. but I it's still, it's still just like everybody loves. Yeah, it. No, like, you don't, you don't. I don't know anyone who's like fuck Groundhog Day. Yeah, I would be surprised anybody who, if you brought up, told them to say five good Bill Murray movies, wouldn't bring up Groundhog Day in the list. And uh, should note, Brian Doyle Murray's in this movie. Yes, he is. Buster. He's one of the officiators. Yeah. Uh, official officiaries. Yeah. For the Groundhog. Yeah. Also want to note, again, you know, not a lot of cred in terms mm -hmm. of awards was, again, nominated for Best Comedic Performance at the MTV Awards for wow. Bill Murray. Again, he lost. This time to Robin Williams. Aladdin. Mrs. Doubtfire? Oh. Aladdin. Okay. I'll, I'll give that one. If, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think you can he, debate that one again. I, I don't know if you can, considering how much that one was Robin Williams ad-libbing. Like, if that was all written, if all of Robin Williams' lines were already pre-written and he was re just reading them, I would say you had no contest, Bill Murray. But... I don't know. I, th I think Groundhog Day and Bill Murray are so good, too, that, like, you could, you could talk. You could debate this. Plus, the genie is sort of like a side character, whereas he's the lead. He's not a side character. He's the whole damn movie. He's not Aladdin. His name is not in the title. It's not Genie. It's yeah, Aladdin. But the failure of every other Aladdin movie was the lack of Robin Williams. Yeah, I think it was just because there should only be one Aladdin movie. And because they didn't have Robin Williams. Nobody cared about like, Everybody cared. They had, you know how many times I've seen that movie? I could probably recite every line they had the of the dude genie who did right Homer now. Simpson take over as the genie. He's pretty noteworthy. I, yeah, but people don't think of him uh, as anything but Homer. Yeah. Yeah, crotchety, Aladdin. crotchety old man. Yes, you are. You are. <laughs> uh, let's move along to sort of the change, the mm -hmm. zag in Bill Murray's career. 1998, is, mm -hmm. Rushmore, yep. teaming with Wes Anderson here. Forever changing the path of his, I, I believe, of his movies. Because I think this is when Bill Murray fully embraced, I Serious. am old man Bill Murray, and old man Bill Murray can't always be... A super comedic actor. I don't necessarily think that. I think it was more like Bill Murray embracing, like, I'm going to do dramatic stuff, that not too. just comedy. I but think he's that, comedic in this. I, he is, but it's still quirky comedic. It's, it's not like laugh out loud. That's true. It's comedy. Wes Anderson yeah. comedy. And this is, I mean, the story of, you know, a student and this father who are competing over this teacher yes. as their love interest. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it is funny. It is quirky, but it's not like laugh out loud, like Ghostbusters, Groundhog Day or anything like that. Okay. I guess I can agree with that. that. And, th and that's where sort of yeah, like, he it is became... definitely the, the turn to the serious Murray. Yeah. Or it's one of the steps in that yes. direction for sure. And I don't know, where do you stand on Rushmore? I think I mean I think most people really like it. I think I was actually fortunate enough to see Rushmore before any other Wes Anderson movies came out. Yeah, so I, I think I saw it theatrically it. actually. I didn't I was not that fortunate. But I remember being uh pretty floored by Jason Schwartzman's performance. Yes. I think I, I like Bill Murray in the movie, mm -hmm. but I think Jason Schwartzman kind of steals the show. Well, he's also the main, char main right. character. Right, but like and, he's yeah. he's so, like he like, you know, it, there's a so serious element to both of them. There's a mm -hmm. comedic element, but he's much more the comedic side I can as agree opposed to serious. And I think that really rubs off, like, you know, his rivalry with, like, mm -hmm. Luke Wilson. Uh, yes. Also, you know. Oh, are they? Yeah, I still exactly, say that yeah. every time exactly. I hear or, or, you know, all the club season and stuff like yeah. that. There's a very comedic mm -hmm. side to him. Interestingly enough, he was one of 1,200 kids that they auditioned for the role wow. of Max Fisher. And he came in in a blazer with a homemade... Uh, Rushmore badge attached to it that he had made on his own. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Doesn't hurt that he has, you know, he's a relative of Francis Ford Coppola, but... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. I didn't the, really not, 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 not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, when Bill Murray first read the script for Rushmore, he thought it was so fantastic that he said he wanted to do it so badly, he would do it for free. 
Wow. Which is funny because the film had a $20 million budget, which not a heck of a lot, but when you see the next film we're talking about, it'll make a lot more sense. Yes, and it also makes sense with this, which is on the first day... Well, and also, you know, you think Bill Murray's done all this amazing comedic stuff. Even though it wasn't fully obvious at the time, he's transitioning into these more serious roles. So I think it's so interesting that the following thing happened, which is on the first day of principal photography with Wes Anderson, uh, when he was talking to Bill Murray and delivering directions, he was whispering. He was a hush whisper, as it was described as, because he was so odd to be working with Bill Murray. And graciously, Bill Murray deferred publicly to Anderson, helped haul equipment, and when Disney denied a helicopter scene that would have cost 75 grand, gave Anderson a blank I check mean, I to think cover it, the cost. I think it makes sense that he's, just, I believe, essentially been in everything yes. Anderson's done. So you know, I'm, they I'm clearly, except for Bottle Rocket, which was pre right. this. They, so they, they definitely have a strong relationship. I think it's interesting in terms of you know. Um, respect that was occurred, you know, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. he was nominated for a uh, Golden Globe. Awesome. For a supporting role. Mm -hmm. He lost to Ed Harris for Truman Show, Ooh. which I think is an interesting one. That yeah. was a good, good performance. That's a really by good movie. Uh, but it did win the Indie Spirit Award for Best Director, and he won Best Supporting Male at awesome. the Indie Spirit Award. So. <laughs> I think it's funny that the people who were playing his kids in the movie, mm -hmm. he actually hated. So, oh, really? so cool. most of him berating them is ad libbed of him actually just going off That's on awesome. the actors. Just like <laughs> Also just want to say the love interest in the movie, Olivia Williams, yes. might be coming back uh, later in our mm -hmm. discussion. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Just saying. The next film we're gonna talk about when I was talking about the twenty million dollar yes. budget for Rushmore being big in comparison is lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Four million dollars. Yeah. I couldn't believe that when I read that. Yeah, ridiculously small. That's saying and this is the Sofia Coppola mm -hmm. second film. This is follow up to the Virgin Suicide. Suicides, <sighs> which yeah i had a lot of trouble enjoying i think virgin suicides might be in my top five most hated movies really all times. i fucking hate that movie so i actually i strongly resisted lost in translation for years I'd... because i didn't want so many people well... i knew talked about loving it and i didn't want to go in already angry at the director and then have my view t turn right but then so many people only ever said good things about it that i was always worried that i would go in and love it just because other people loved it so i waited a long time i think I, when this came out 2003 i think i saw this like maybe 2009 hmm. like 2010 like really really recently for me i i, I think i did I see this theatrically? I might have seen this theatrically. You know, I I enjoy it. I don't love it. I know a lot of people who love it. I I, th I think it's a a decent film. I I, I think it's really interesting because it's really dependent entirely on the relationship between Scarlett Johansson yes. and Bill Murray, which is very engaging. Yes, and they're, they're very good together. Sophia Coppola wrote the lead role for, specifically for Bill Murray and said if he didn't want to do it. Uh, she wouldn't have done the movie which and it was inspired by her relationship with um what's his name um i can't remember his name right now uh not charlie kaufman um oh oh um 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 scrap now it's gone well anyway you'll find it yeah anyway. however the santori whiskey ad uh francis ford coppola actually did an ad in that akira kurosawa directed for santori wow. whiskey so that whole thing is inspired by that. And also I find it entertaining that uh, like most of that scene is ad-libbed as well. Bill Murray's response is mostly ad-libbed. Spike Jones. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. thank Spike you. Spike Jones, yeah. Her relation, her, mm -hmm. her disintegrating relationship. Of course, I'm referring to Scarlett Johansson's relationship with Giovanni Ribisi, her husband yes. in the movie. Yes, yes. Um, it's yeah. Bill Murray's favorite film of his own, which I think is an important thing to note considering how much he obviously gets impassioned in all these projects sure, yeah. he's done especially Wes Anderson I mean I'm, yeah. so, I'm amazed that it's not, it's not a Wes Anderson yeah. film that's his favorite uh, and when I actually did finally watch the movie by the way I did enjoy it and I still do enjoy the movie but I have a weird kind of knee jerk reaction to wanting to praise it too much without re-watching it because mm. I wonder how much of that but I did find this this interesting which is that for years no one other than Bill Murray Sofia Coppola and Scarlett Johansson knew what the characters whispered at the end of the film. If you can find it online. Uh, yeah, that, but in October 28th, 2009, a YouTube video uh, surfaced containing enhanced audio of this part with subtitles and all zoomed in and everything where you could find out what he actually said, which is, if spoilers, if you have seen the movie, fast forward now. Otherwise, said, uh, when John is ready for his next business trip, go up to that man and tell him the truth, okay? So I've heard something different too. I think actually. Really? Yeah. Huh. So 
So maybe look it up on the internet. Yeah. Maybe it's different There's since 2009 is quite stuff, a bit yeah. of time. But, but either way, the idea that, you know, even you could know when they left it really right, ambiguous, yeah. which I yeah. think added a lot to the film. Yeah, I, I, I wish it had remained ambiguous. <laughs> the internet never lets anything yeah. remain ambiguous if it can, Spencer. Come on. <laughs> I think it's uh, interesting to note that, you know, despite coming out in a very challenging year, the same year that Return of the King and Mystic River came out, mm. this, this film did a decent job holding its own. You know, it was uh, it, uh, Sofia Coppola won Best Original Screenplay, mm, uh-huh. despite that. You Makes know, sense. she uh, was nominated, there was nominated for Best Picture, lost to Return of the King. Okay. Bill Murray was nominated for Best Lead Actor, lost to Sean Penn for Mystic uh-huh. River. Uh, Sofia Coppola was nominated for Best Director, lost to Peter Jackson, but you know, even winning one Academy Award is pretty decent. Even being nominated in the same with Peter Jackson. But Not at the bad. Golden Globes, it won Best uh, Comedy or Musical. Hmm. It won Best Performance in a Comedy or Musical for Bill Murray. Mm-hmm. And it um, still lost to um, <laughs> Sophia, or Peter Jackson for Best Director. But, I, think, yeah. I think it's interesting to note, uh, one of the things I always remember about this movie is also that it's very picaresque very iconic looking mm-hmm. this there's a lot of like scenery shots and mm-hmm. establishing shots that's relatively understandable because Sofia Coppola went to Tokyo I think where it takes place yeah I Tokyo think, and took a bunch of photographs and then took those photographs and tried to recreate mm. the scene for the purpose of things mm. when they actually made the film that's cool yeah Gotta Virgin give her credit for that. After making such a horrible movie, to turn around and make that. I, I don't hate Virgin Suicides as much as you, but it's a tough one to watch. I'll say that. Um, but that brings us to this Friday, December 7th. We're talking Hyde Park on Hudson, mm-hmm. which is the story of the love affair between FDR yes. and his distant cousin, Margaret Stuckley, centered around the weekend in 1939 when King and Queen, the King and Queen of the UK visited upstate New York. Yes. So you've got, which I think is interesting because it's the second movie this year that involves a famous actor playing a very famous president in a very specific am- amount of time. Like it's like Lincoln was, you know, like thirty mm-hmm. days, and this is like a weekend. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting. We have two iconic. Oh, there's there's more to it than that. Okay, so you got Bill Murray mm-hmm. as FDR. Yes, you've got which Laura Lenny such a great cast as his distant cousin slash love affair, okay. Margaret Stuckley. Okay. His wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh-huh. Olivia Williams, coming back at Boom. you from Rushmore. Mm-hmm. And it gets even more interesting than that. Let me Does break it? it down for you. Break it down, Spencer. Um, you got Simon West playing King George the Sixth, who you might recently remember as Colin Firth's character in The King's Speech. Crazy mm-hmm. coming back at you. Mm-hmm. Good times. Mm-hmm. You know, I and the film directed by Robert Michelle, uh, who did Notting Hill, oh, he okay. did Changing Lanes, and he did Morning Glory. So, dude is diverse filmography. Wow. That's quite a variety. I'm curious to see. You know, I think I think it'll be interesting to see Bill Murray in this role. Yes. It seems like a sort of different vibe for him than I he's agree. done in the past. I mean, he's playing like he's not just he can't as weird as it sounds. He can't Bill Murray up his role. Like, he can't... uh, All this talk about ad-libbing and and working with directors that are almost tailoring things to him and to his work. He's playing a historical figure. He's playing a historical figure that existed when we had, uh, you know, motion picture recordings. Like, it's... Plus, it's also sort of like the romantic love triangle Uh story. It's not generally something you think of in Bill Murray movies. Except maybe Rushmore, but that was a much more comedic one. Yeah, and, and even then, it's like, you know, playing a historical figure in a, like relatively hidden love triangle so you're going to be playing a, a person that was well known but in an aspect that wasn't well known so you both have to like you have to pander to both sides i think it's gonna be really interesting to see what he does yeah, with the role i'm looking forward to it mm-hmm. uh and join us next time as we do our dvd rundown for the week of december 11th mm-hmm. and as always you can find us at uh, mcguffinpodcast.com yes. twitter.com slash mcguffincast facebook.com slash mcguffinpodcast Phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes. We're on Miro. We're on Blip. We're on Roku. Well, get glue. Check in. Get some badges. Get some stickers. Sticky uh, stickers. You know, leave us reviews on iTunes and all those good mm-hmm. places. And uh, Leave we'll us see. obscene comments on the site so we can we'll troll you back. Yeah, we love it. We do. Lied. We'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.